Hello! Welcome to Stories Podcast. I'm your host, Amanda Weldon. Today's episode starts the long-awaited conclusion of our original series, Firefly. You've been asking, and now we are proud to present the beginning of Book 3, Firefly Revolt, by Daniel Hines. Thanks! Enjoy the episode! Firefly Revolt Chapter 1. Picking Up Someone was pounding on the door. Jill moaned pitifully. It felt like they were pounding on her skull instead. Every last molecule of her body was sore. She opened her eyes, slow as the rising sun, and found that even her eyelids hurt. Still, all of that was nothing compared to the empty ache in her heart. Grandpa was gone. The pounding continued. With a long, croaking groan, Jill rolled herself off the couch and onto the dusty hardwood floor. She hit with a thump and then sat up, rubbing at her eyes. They were here. Jill wasn't sure who they were, but she knew someone would come. A missile couldn't streak through the countryside without alerting someone. It was likely one of those spooky agencies with the three-letter names, like FBI or CIA or DHS. Probably it was some hairy-knuckled federal agent on the stoop, one with a mouthful of questions Jill felt in no way ready to answer. Maybe if I just lie here and close my eyes, they'll go away, she thought, but she knew they wouldn't. They'd come back with a search warrant or they'd smash in the door. She had made a plan the night before. A wild plan, to be sure, but one that had no chance of success if she was hauled in to Giga City for questioning. She had to move. Mom, she whispered to herself as the pounding on the door continued. Gotta think of Mom. Next to her on the floor was her hiking backpack. Inside were the broken pieces of the firefly armor a change of clothes, her computer gear, and all the money that had been in the house. She had been preparing to make her getaway last night, had laid down for just a moment's rest, and exhaustion had taken her by surprise. She had passed out and slept for... She looked at her phone. Ten hours! It was early afternoon, and now it was too late to escape. Or was it? She slipped her phone into one pocket the Proteus tool in the other, and snatched Mom's car keys off the dining room table. Her body bellowed pain with every step, but she forced herself to ignore it. She slipped upstairs and into her mother's bedroom. It was the only one overlooking the backyard. The room smelled like Mom. It was so sudden and real that Jill turned, near expecting to find her standing there. Her mom being carried away flashed through her mind, the heat of the fire and the twisting acrid smoke. Tears stung at Jill's eyes and she wiped them away with the back of her hand. It was time to go. She opened a window and swung her legs out, then twisted so she was hanging from her fingers. It had worked well enough last time she'd tried, but last time she wasn't a giant walking bruise. This time her grip slipped right away, her hand slapping uselessly at the windowsill as she fell into the long grass below. A breathless second later, she landed on her back in the yard, her bag on top of her. A yelp of pain slipped from her mouth before she could help it. Her head swam, dizzy. She heard footsteps approaching. Gotta go, gotta get up, she thought, but she could hardly think straight, let alone move. Footsteps, closer. The sun behind the approaching figure made them a black silhouette. Jill knew she should be afraid, but she was too empty inside to feel much of anything. She searched her gut for that matchstick of anger, for the fire to get her burning, but there was nothing. Cold, dead, nothing. The footsteps stopped. The shadow leaned over her. Jill? Are you okay? Jill blinked up weakly, trying to get the spinning pieces of her mind back together. The shadow took a knee next to her in the dirt, helping her to sit up, hands soft and gentle. Look at you. You're all beat up. Are you okay? What happened? Why'd you jump out the window? Where's the barn? Where's your grandpa? Specs? Jill said weakly. Yeah, Jill. I'm here. Who? Who else? Specs looked around at the empty farm. Just me. 
I got your text last night and then saw you fighting Harpy on the news. I'm sorry. I should have been there. The simple kindness tore open her already broken heart. Her friend was back. Jill threw her arms around Speck and began to cry. She sobbed and sputtered and slowly tried to get her breath back. Spex patted her back awkwardly, waiting for the storm to pass. They stayed like that, huddled together in the grass for a long while. With time, Jill was able to speak. She told Spex what happened. The fight with Harpy, the missile, the bunker, her mother, all of it. When she got to the part about Grandpa, Speck started crying too. Shining, silent tears slid down his cheeks. So we should probably leave, Jill finished. That missile must have sent up some kind of alert. Speck shook his head, pulling off his glasses to rub clear his eyes. No, I don't think so, he said. When your grandpa... When he and I updated the security, I saw all of the systems he had running. He had some kind of signal jammer that covered everything from here to Springvale, so no one could tell where Firefly was coming from. So, no one's coming? Not unless we call them. Well, that's something at least, said Jill as Spex picked her up off the ground and set her on her feet, letting her lean on his shoulder. Careful, between Harpy and breaking out of the bunker, you took a real beating. Spex, why are you here? I told you. You texted me. No, I mean... Jill paused, head swimming as she cast about for the right words. She felt so guilty. About what she'd said to Spex, about Grandpa, about her mom. She didn't think she deserved to have anyone be so kind to her. I mean, I thought you were mad at me. You were right to be mad at me. I shouldn't have said what I did. I'm sorry. I'm lucky to have you as a friend. Speck smiled and helped Jill towards the house. You sure are. But you can make it up to me later. For now, let's figure out how to save your mom. Chapter 2. The Will, The Way Four Aspirin Two giant sandwiches and one shower later, Jill felt almost human again. Not good, she wouldn't feel good again until she had her mom back, but definitely better than before. She came down the stairs carefully, toweling her hair. Spex was waiting at the kitchen table. He had a glass of chocolate milk by one elbow and was hacking away on his laptop. So, any progress? she asked, taking the seat next to him and watching the lines of code march across the screen. The system was basically obliterated by the blast, but everything that mattered was backed up remotely. So, do you think we can fix the suit? Sure, the repair schematics are right here, he said, and a picture of the Firefly suit appeared on his screen. As she watched, it began to take itself apart, piece by piece, step by step. At any other time, Jill would have found it magical to watch. Now, though, she was just happy to have one problem solved. Schematics are good. What about the parts, though? Most of this we can fix, but the core of the thruster needs to be replaced and all of the spare parts are either destroyed or buried. The core is mainly used as the heart of big-time missiles, strictly defense contractor stuff, so we'll need to find someone who can get and sell illegal military tech to a couple of teenage civilians. Oh, that's no problem. How can that possibly not be a problem? Speck said, turning from his screen. Remember? I told you about my grandpa's guy, Sharkskin. Grandpa told me he can get anything. It rings a bell, Speck said, turning back to his computer and hacking away. Sharkskin, Sharkskin. Ah, here we go. He pulled up a file on Sharkskin that Grandpa must have put together. It had Sharkskin's picture, pages of personal info, a complex web chart of loyalties and dealings, and a cell phone number. So... You just give him a call? Spex asked dubiously. I know your grandpa would say... Spex trailed off, a hitch in his voice. Jill looked over and saw tears standing in his eyes. Jill's instantly started to fill with tears as well, and she blinked them away hastily. I know, Spex, she said, laying a hand on his and squeezing. I miss him too, but we gotta focus on saving my mom right now. 
It's what he would have wanted. I know, you're right. He'd be proud of you. Spex nodded, but Jill felt a knot in her gut. Grandpa had regretted giving her the suit. He was right. She had been too young, too angry. Would he really want her fixing it to save mom? Should she just tell the police the truth and let things fall where they would? She couldn't decide. I found something else, too, Speck said. There's a lot of details about an address in Giga City. It looks like it's the top floor of a skyscraper downtown. I'm not exactly sure what's there, but there's at least a replica of the computer that was in the bunker. What, really? asked Jill. So it's another base? Maybe. It has a computer server, that's all I can say for sure. It was one of the remote backup locations. Well, it's something, Jill said. We should go check it out. Maybe it will have some of the equipment we need to fix the suit. Spex agreed, pulling off his glasses to wipe away his tears. So what first, sharkskin or the building? Jill was up and pacing, thinking hard. I'll call Sharkskin, you go to Giga City and check it out. Who knows where they're keeping my mom? It could be bad, so I want to move fast. Is that okay with you? I can visit a building for sure, but what about Sharkskin? Is it really a good idea for you to meet him alone? Jill looked at the bag containing the firefly suit. It may not be able to fly, but there are parts of the armor that work, and the flight suit I wear underneath is in good shape. I'll be all right. Spex's computer chimed an alert. What now? Jill said, turning back to the screen. It's my super alert, said Spex. It scrapes all the news sites looking for any breaking super news. Something's going on in Giga City and the Scarlet King is taking credit. Spex pulled up the alert and it flashed to a video feed. Jill watched in horror as the Crimson Cannonball and Werebear fought desperately against two foes. The villains looked alike superficially, with black suits and brick-like skin, but their bodies were wildly different. One was a muscular woman, and, as Jill and Spex watched, she stretched out her arms impossibly long and then snapped them like a whip, hurling Werebear backwards into a concrete parking deck. The shaggy hero crashed through wall after wall like a wrecking ball, finally disappearing in a cloud of dust and rubble. The other brick was tall and slender, and his enormous bald head pulsed with power. He sat cross-legged in midair, palms up and out. Rubble flowed around him in a telekinetic storm, and every time Crimson Cannonball got close, a piece would fly out and knock him away. Not good, said Spex. The banner under the image changed as they watched, flipping from Scarlet King Super's attack to Where is Firefly? Jill looked on, her stomach sinking into a queasy twist. How could she expect anyone else to save her mom when they all looked to Firefly to save them? What do we do, Jill? Spex asked quietly. The plan, Jill said with a sigh, picking up her phone and dialing a number. It rang for nearly a full minute before it clicked on. Sharkskin, said Jill after a moment. It's Jill Jay's. I need to set up a deal for my grandpa. Chapter 3. Shark Skin Jill pulled her mother's car into the general lot at Springvale and killed the engine. Her hands were shaky, sweat prickled along her brow. You got this, Jill, she said to herself in the mirror. For mom. She stepped into the afternoon sun, stretching and checking down her equipment one last time. She had managed to piece together a few tricks and pieces of armor over her flight suit. Over that, she wore a baggy sweater dress, thankful the air had turned chilly. She would have been hard-pressed to hide anything in a tank top and shorts. Standing in the parking lot, she mentally ran through her plan again. It was the millionth time, but it seemed to take the edge off her anxiety, if only for a minute. She was meeting Sharkskin in the same abandoned building that Grandpa Jack had used before. The meeting wasn't for an hour, but Jill wanted to get there early and make sure the place was secure. She wasn't exactly sure what to look for, but Spex had given her a little something to take care of it. Oh my god, it's the Sasquatch! Jill heard someone call. She turned and saw Madison and her friends, sitting in Madison's new yellow jeep. Someone get a picture, quick! She said, and they all burst out into giggles. 
Jill wanted to tell her not today, that she didn't have the time, but something else slipped out before she could help it. Good one, Jill said, walking up to Madison's door. Careful, though, haven't you heard? Sasquatch are dangerous. As she spoke, Jill's arms twitched towards Madison. Again, she reached inside for that matchstick of anger and found nothing but the echo of her grandpa's words. Too young, driven by anger. She had to be better. Right now, being better meant walking away. With a sigh, she turned and headed into town. Oh, we're so scared, called Madison, laughing again. Jill shook her head and kept walking. Madison could win this round. Jill had more important things to worry about. Like getting out of this alive, she thought, staring up at the abandoned building. It was still a good spot. Springvale was a small town, but it fit its community like a glove. Between town center and the abandoned building, there was a good amount of business in farm equipment, livestock, and even an active farmer's market. No one would notice if way on the outskirts there was a little light, a little noise. At least, that was Jill's hope. She did a couple loops around the outside of the building. There was a small dirt road that led to the other side of town, a broken-down ford up on blocks, and a smattering of assorted litter. Finding nothing out of place, Jill opened the door and peeked inside. But for the thick wisps of spiderweb, it was nearly empty. There was some canvas-covered furniture and a couple boxes of old shelving, but that was it. At least, that was all she could see. Of course, Firefly may see a whole lot more. She touched her ear and pulled a metal ball from her pocket. Hey, Spex, you ready to try it out? The ball was warm and seemed to hum faintly in her palm. Grandpa had helped her build it over the summer and Spex had just finished programming it that morning. At least, he said he had. All good, just give it a toss, Spex replied in her earpiece. You sure? Like a baseball? No, not like a baseball. Very not like a baseball. Just straight up a couple feet. Relax, I was just messing with you. Jill lightly threw the ball in the air. It went up and hung there, floating in space, doing nothing. Spex? Patience, young grasshopper. A second later, the ball blossomed open like a flower, releasing a hundred tiny pinpricks of light. They swirled out like leaves caught in the wind, a wonderful twirling tornado. It's beautiful, Jill said softly. And seems to be working well, Spex replied. I can see you through the camera drones, but let's try the scanners. The points of light stopped swirling randomly and began to zip about like fireflies. They spread and flew throughout the house, casting strange, weaving shadows. Scans are clean. No one inside, no electronics, no trouble. I don't know about that, Jill said. Sharkskin was walking across the yard. He was wearing his iridescent blue-gray suit and a miserable expression. Unfortunately, he was flanked by two more of the Scarlet King's brick supers. Idiot, she thought. Of course Scarlet King knew Sharkskin. I'm picking up three people coming your way, Speck said. Their scans are strange. They may be supers. Safe bet. It's Sharkskin and two bricks. What? You better get out of there, Jill. I don't like that at all. No time, she said, plucking the hovering ball out of the air and putting it back in her pocket. Hello there, Jill, Sharkskin said, closing the door behind them. Was that some kind of scanner? No honor among thieves? Jill eyed the two brick men as they slid into position on either side of Sharkskin. In person, she saw their skin wasn't just brick-colored, it was rough and pebbly like stone. These two weren't the same as the ones from the news, though. One was burly, covered in craggy muscles. The other was slender but normal, apart from the color and texture of his skin. These two, plus the two from the news, made four total. If there were four, Jill bet there were more. How many people had the Scarlet King transformed? Sharkskin, she said, pulling a pair of gloves from her pocket and sliding them on. You want to talk about honor? At least I came alone. She nodded at the hulking bricks by his side. Who are your friends? The brute glared at her, 
jagged muscles swelling. Interestingly, Jill found she didn't feel afraid. Of course, since she lost Grandpa and Mom was taken, she hadn't felt much of anything. Oh, these guys, said Sharkskin. Funny thing, just before you called, these guys showed up, uh, sent by the Scarlet King. They said if anyone called looking for tech, they had to come along. Not real friendly, let me tell you. It was only then that Jill noticed Sharkskin had a fairly fresh black eye. A black eye and a midnight purple bruise along his jaw to match. Well, here we all are, Jill said, cooler than she felt. You have the core for the thruster? About that, Sharkskin said slowly, his eyes flashing a warning at Jill. The two bricks had slid apart, moving along the walls surrounding her. Seems uh, Scarlet King doesn't want me operating anymore. Me and these two gentlemen are paying one last visit to all my customers. He rubbed his neck, looking embarrassed. Sorry, kid. It's nothing personal. I'm just, like, very fond of my arms being attached to my body, you know? Jill nodded. A fight, then. Directionless as she was, a fight was appealing. Hit the other guys. Don't get hit. It was a beautiful simplicity. A magnificent instinct. As long as she won. Tentatively, like a shy dog offered scraps, Jill reached into herself. There was no fire, just numbness and shock, just guilt. She needed to feel something, anything, but her mind seemed to shut down at the idea of anger, of violence. The brick giant approached Jill. She stood her ground, a tree before the whirlwind, searching for her anger, her strength, looking for anything and finding nothing. The brick slapped her across the ribs. It was casual, barely more than a playful swat, but it crushed the breath from Jill's lungs and sent her tumbling across the room. She tasted blood in her mouth, the warmth and iron. Tears stung her eyes and she fought for breath, sucking eagerly at the air in groans and gasps. She's not a super, said the slender brick curiously. Just a silly girl. He turned towards the brute. Finish the job, and let's get out of here. Silly girl, Jill thought. Grandpa Jack had said that, too. Maybe they were both right. She was lying on the ground, struggling even to breathe. Jill! It was specks in her ear. You need to get up. Please, Jill, you need to get up. How long had he been talking? Jill shook her head. The big brick loomed over her now, a black bag in one hand. Jill, I know you've got a lot on your mind, but I need you to move. Jill, you gotta move. The giant swiped at her, but she flinched away. He grunted and hit her again, this time on the thigh. Luckily, she had some armor plating there, and it didn't hurt nearly as bad as the first blow. Still, it sent her spinning across the floor, crushing into Sharkskin and knocking them both over. Come on, kid, whispered Sharkskin as they untangled. Calling Gramps already. He's the only one who can stop these goons. Grandpa's dead, Jill whispered back. As she said it, she realized it was the first time she had admitted it out loud. She had cried to herself and told Spex the story, but this felt different. Felt real. Something gave way inside her, tearing free like a scab. All the hurt and pain, all the sadness that had been filling her body like trash in a barrel. It was suddenly too much. If your gramps is dead, then so are we, whispered Sharkskin. The big brick grabbed her by the collar and threw her across the room again. This time, Jill barely felt it. It was all too much. Come on, Jill, said Spex. Think of your mom. Mom? If there was no Firefly, who would save her? Jill couldn't think of anyone else. She suddenly realized that if she didn't find some fight in herself soon, Her mom might not get rescued at all. I know I'm too angry, Grandpa, she thought. I'm sorry. And I'm sorry for what happened, but I needed to save those people, and now I need to save Mom. And myself. It may not be what you want me to do, but it is what you would have done. I love you, Grandpa, she said aloud. And somehow, she was sure he heard it. Finish her already, said the slender brick bored. 
Tears welled in her eyes and she felt that matchstick flare of anger. Scarlet King had taken her mom, had sent goons to kidnap her or worse. Didn't he know that Jill was strong like her mother? Didn't he know Jill was brilliant like her father? Didn't he know Jill was wild like her old grandpa Jack? She pushed herself up from the dusty floor, staggering to her feet and wiping a spot of blood from the corner of her mouth. Wild and dangerous. That, too. All right, then, she said, looking from one brick to the other and raising her hands. Who's first? The giant brick roared, spit flying from his craggy lips. Come on, Jill roared back, ripping away her sweater and revealing pieces of the firefly armor wired along her black flight suit. The thruster was broken, but parts were still functional. Jill had assembled them on a lattice of metal bands, and she looked like half a skeleton in gleaming platinum. Firefly! she bellowed, and around her, like the inexorable gears of a ticking clock, like a flower blooming in fast motion, the skeleton flared to life. To be continued.